audience. When I was producing, I would hold the auditions, obviously, as the artistic director and the producer of the theater. And my advice to every actor who's trying really hard to get the job is to sit in casting sessions, a casting session, and you will come to realize very quickly why some people get the job, but mostly why you don't get the job. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Kevin Getz. How you doing, Kevin? Hey, I'm well, Alex. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you are, as they say, an OG in the test screening space of figuring out what the audience loves and and wants and and more importantly, what they're willing to pay money for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been doing this why. for doing it for a couple of years now. I've been doing it for quite a long time, uh, 35 uh, years. That's yeah, wow. So you've seen a few things along the way, I'm sure. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> if these walls could talk, as they say. <laughs> well, I'll ask questions and you could tell stories that you can say on air. And then after we stop recording, you could tell me all the stories you can't yes, say. On I'll air. call you on your private line and we'll t- I'll give you the real the real stories. <laughs> so first and foremost, how did you get into this line of work? How did you get interested in the film industry in general? You know, I've always been interested in uh, in film, but I was always I always like to say sort of my DNA was uh, being in show business. I was a child actor. Mm. It was in my blood. I always knew that this was what I was supposed to do. Uh, I was a dancer. I was a singer. I was what we call a triple threat if you're uh, from the Broadway scene and uh, made my living doing a lot of commercials, TV commercials and theater uh, around the New York area. So that's, that's what I did until I went to Mason Grove School of the Arts at Rutgers, which is one of the best acting conservatories in the country. And I studied with Bill Esper, the Meisner Technique, and that was a four-year conservatory. Graduated, went to New York, and started working up pretty regularly. But sort of begin to get began to get like burnt out uh, at my, in my early 20s. And I'm like, this is not gonna be a good thing if I, you know, unless I really, um, unless I really uh, commit to giving up control, if you will, and, allowing others to decide my fate. I loved and still love the art of acting and the craft of it and the under uncovering a character and all of that. But what I found was I had a business sense on the other side of my brain that needed to be nurtured. So when I was 17, I started my first business. So I had an entrepreneurial business sensibility and combined with the creative and the artistic sensibility. So it kind of was the way for me to, uh, I had to listen to both voices and it was kind of a way for me to find uh, the right path. And it turned out that I got a survival job when I came to California to work as an actor because my residuals were drying up. I had done a play for four and five months. So, you know, you don't get paid that much in theater. And so I needed to do some odd jobs. And one of them was working at a place called NRG, National Research Group. And it was doing these test screenings. I had no idea what that meant. And it was about 35, 36 years ago. And I was sort of pl- sort of plucked out of the chorus, if you will, by the uh, principals of the company because they saw a potential in me, I suppose. And, 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 and I began to uh, pull or coordinate focus groups, like pick the people to be in the focus groups after the screening. And then within um, two years, I was trained to be a moderator. And I didn't really know what that was, the art of it. I didn't really know much about marketing at the time. And it was all sort of learned in the field, you know, out there. And what was really interesting, Alex, is that when I would moderate in the beginning, I would actually play the role of a moderator, like I would... (laughs) I would, I would would give myself an objective, you know, you need to get as much information as you possibly can. That's your objective and your scene that you're about to do. And you're a great listener. You've got to, you know, my actions, if you're an actor, you know what that means. Your, my actions were, you know, really to, uh, to gain as much information as I can to probe to, you know, real, real active, active, um, 
uh, verbs, which are the act, the way the actor sort of creates behavior. <clears throat> and that's how I got through them. And I was successful at it. And suddenly, well, I wouldn't say suddenly, I would say slowly, actually, uh, I began to realize that, you know, <clears throat> um, I, 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 I was, there was an art to this, you know, there was, there was a way of probing. There was a way of leading the witness. I had to sort of learn those things, and I took all sorts of sorts of um, courses in terms of uh, um, other moderators. And I joined the Qualitative Research Consultants Association, which is sort of the leading moderators. And I would take workshops and things. And I learned uh, uh, proje sorry, proje projective techniques and different kinds of ways to um, to uh, to engage with people behind two-way mirror, you know, the two-way mm -hmm. glass and so forth. And uh, and then I became, I guess, one of the most requested moderators um, talking 30 years ago, 25 years ago. And then uh, I was also a hyphenate. You know, I also still had my hand in acting. And then I moved into producing. Mm -hmm. And I began to produce at my own theater in 1990. Uh, and then I... I, I, which I ran for five years as the artistic director and producer up in San Luis Obispo is the professional theater called Central Coast Repertory Theater. And then I started doing movies and uh, television movies in particular. And then I made one and got a lot of acclaim and we won an Emmy Award for it called Wild Iris. And I really began to speak the film language in a different way. So now I had my moderating on the one side and knew how to get into and talk to directors and producers about their movie. But you know what was interesting, and I think this was my, my competitive edge, was that I, I am an artist and I understand the right. and have a tremendous respect for filmmakers. I have a tremendous respect for the artists and people in our field who have to sort of put their um, babies, you know, and give birth to these children that are... Um, are their creative beings and they really take on a life of their own and they're so invested filmmakers are so invested and so when i have and i call it the privilege to work on a movie i really feel there's a responsibility i have to represent the audience in the best way possible to give filmmakers the best information they can possibly get this is a long way of saying that my journey was all meant to be it's all the perfect path if you will so I talk about in my book, Audienceology, which I know that you, um, you've you read and and, um, and we're trying to say nice things about, <laughs> at least I think that's what you say. Yes. Uh, uh, I talk about finding your and, A-N-D. So you could start in one thing in life and think it's the absolute thing that you're supposed to be doing. And then you have a skill set that also is really pretty strong and you get to a point, and if you're lucky enough, as I was, to find great mentors and marry those two passions and find your and, you will actually flourish in a more complete way. That's a, that's profound because so many of us as filmmakers start off like, I need to be Steven Spielberg. How many people said, I, I'm the next Steven Spielberg? I teach at film schools. uh several several times a year in all the major film schools around the country and i sure. have to tell you many right exactly but then as you start going through the path uh and this is only from someone like myself who's been doing this for close to 30 years as well uh you get to that place where you're like well i'm not gonna be steven because there's only one steven so then we're like well and, and i could one, do those by the way and there's only one alex and correct when you can, and when you can realize right that there's only one Alex, and Alex is extraordinary in his own way. Correct. And Stephen can't be Alex. Correct. Then you and and that takes a lot of courage and confidence yeah. to live in your own skin comfortably. And it took me years <laughs> to get there. It didn't oh, yeah. just happen overnight, right? And you yep. can relate to that, right, Alex? Absolutely, one hundred and ten percent. It took me forever to finally understand who I was, feel comfortable in my skin. And that and that you're talking about is so important because it's just like, well, I could be a director and I could also maybe own a post-production company. And then, and, and exactly. And, and then, then I could also write and so and on. And write and have a podcast. 
And but 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 all of these things bring you to the perfect place where you're supposed to be in life. If you yes. really lean into your gifts, not mm -hmm. sit on them and wait in a room for someone to call. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about putting yourself out there, but recognizing all these wonderful things that you have, finding those and or ends and realizing them, you know, and, and that takes a certain degree of courage, I think, and self-assurance. Right. And just like yourself, that you started off as an actor, but you your skill set as an actor lent itself so beautifully into your to your other career, the end of test screenings and 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 understanding the audience and so on. It was kind of like with me, I was like, I was I wanted to be a director, but I also had a skill set in post-production. So I owned, owned a post-production company and I became an editor and I became a colorist and I post supervisor and, and all of that while I was directing. So then Together, I became much more powerful because as a director on jobs, I could package all of it together. I'm like, yeah, I'll do your, I'll edit for free. That's on the practical <laughs> side. But think right. about what you knew as a director that many directors don't know. Mm -hmm. How to say, oh, if I do this, oh my yep. gosh, that is going to cost me a ton in post because I'm going to have yes. to time this. Where other people say, fix it in post. Right. Our famous expression that we hear from many, many <laughs> indie filmmakers is, we'll yes. do it in post, we'll fix it in post. Uh, but you know, and it, and you probably saved yourself countless hours and money oh. by having the skill set of post production. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and even when I'm doing this as a podcaster, understanding how to talk, my skill sets as a director has helped me to talk and and have engaging conversations, raw conversations with my guests, and then all the technical stuff of the behind the scenes stuff. I was able to launch like this because I had 20 years of post production experience, and I'm like a podcast. I could do a podcast in my sleep, uh, you know, comparatively to you know finishing 50 movies in my in my day and so on and so forth. So it was just a really. It, but I love that concept of the and. I've never heard it put that way before. It's a, and I hope people listening don't get caught because they get so caught up and you're like, if you would have just said, I'm only going to be an actor. I'm going to hold on tight to just that. I'm not going to shift. I'm not going to pivot. I'm not going to move and not allow it to unfold in the way it had to unfold for best, you know, the best. Another for you. example, <clears throat> excuse me, another example that I have is when I was an actor, you know, there was so much personal investment that you would put out every time you went on an audition. And, <laughs> oh, and yes. When I was producing, I would hold the auditions, obviously, as the artistic director and the producer of the theater. And my advice to every actor who's trying really hard to get the job is to sit in casting sessions, a casting session, and you will come to realize very quickly why some people get the job, but mostly why you don't get the job. And so much of it is not something that you're doing you may give the best reading but somebody is a the already cast is a redhead and the kid is a really dark haired child and so you realize that that doesn't go with the redhead and you're already committed to the redhead so you know you got to then just so all of those things that if you actually understood the process would make you more effective. And that goes for anything, as you were saying. In your case, it was post-production. In my case, you know, it was it was entrepreneurship, like really leaning into that and saying, hey, you're you're good at this. You're good at business, you know? Uh, I, as I run a research company and one of my uh, probably least uh, strong skills is statistics. Mm. I've learned how to get by, how to speak about means and mediums, all that stuff. But I have great statisticians that I hire that make me look really good. Uh, <laughs> I know my deficits. And that's another superpower is to know what you're not good at mm -hmm. and not be, it's not modesty or immodesty. It's, it's just like, know what you're not good at and then uh, kind of acknowledge it and try to fix it with somebody else or some other person's gift or superpower, it's not gonna be yours. There's so many things I recognize that I do well. And there's so many other things I realize that I'm subpar. I just am. And I don't pathologize it. I simply recognize it and say, I'm gonna fill those, those uh, holes. But you are also comfortable in your own skin. And that's when you're comfortable in your own skin, the ego, 
is a little bit more tamed when it comes to that, hopefully where you can identify those things and go like, I, I can't stand audio St I, to this day, still can't deal with audio. I'm a visual guy. And in post-production, I always just sent it off to the audio guy. I'm like, here, here are the stems, mix it for me, send me a stereo track back or send me the, the stems back and I'll put it in and I'll deliver it. But I, you know, sometimes I would send something, I'm, <laughs> I would send something like, you sent me a mono track. I'm like, I don't, I can't tell. I can't hear mono from stereo. I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it's just uh, completely my kryptonite. It always has been from everything I've ever done. But I understood that and I, you know, didn't try to do it myself. I, I outsourced it. I understood that that's definitely you not know, what I always loved. Things. When I made movies, I always loved the mixes. Um, oh, yeah. I love being in the mixes. I just don't like doing them. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Gotcha. But I always loved the mixes because I I, I always uh, loved sort of um, understanding how much you can really affect oh. in that post-production process. Yeah. And in fact, screenings are really a part of the post-production process, particularly with the studios, but we work on more independent movies than probably studio movies in our total arsenal every year. Just there's so many more movies that are people don't even know about. There's three movies opening this weekend. And, you know, I'd like to know how many of your listeners even, you know, know what they are. Uh, they probably don't know any movie coming out on their radar except Ant-Man, which is in like, you know, three, three, four weeks. Right. Uh, there's a, there's a reason that, you know, uh, that the screenings have become so important in that post-production process because they do inform often, you know, the, the word of mouth um, right. of, of how your movie is going to really perform in the marketplace. So it's, it's a very important measure to understand before, you know, you embark on, you know, the release. So let me ask you, because I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, because I'm assuming there's some filmmakers out there going, well, why do we care about the audience? This is art. I am an artist. An artist, you know, you don't paint lilies. Van Gogh didn't paint lilies for an art, for, for the audience. He, built, he painted it for himself. So uh, to be the devil's advocate, why should filmmakers <clears throat> care about what the audience thinks in today's world, understanding that if it's an independent film versus a studio, studio, $200 million, $100 million, big things at stake, get that. But as far as the indie world is concerned, why should they care? Well, that's saying that a Steven Spielberg or a whatever studio is not an artist. Exactly. <laughs> Number one. <laughs> right. Who all test their movies. All the greats test their movies and have throughout moviedom. In other words, mm -hmm. since the beginning of movies, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd all took their sequences up to Hollywood Boulevard and tested them. Great filmmakers throughout history, great moguls, et cetera, tested their movies. And that has not changed. Uh, I find uh, a person that doesn't do that is doesn't have a respect for the art form. Uh, mm. The art form is not a painting. It's not a novel. It is not a singular vision. It is takes many craftspeople and artists to 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 um, to put to make a movie. Correct. And and uh, I told uh, Ang Lee and I had a, a a bit of a an exchange. It's in the book, uh, my book, where uh, you know he said you know Picasso never tested his paintings, and I said Picasso's supplies cost about five cents. It's and, true. <laughs> and if he didn't like what he did, he could put it in the back of his closet. But you've just been handed a hundred million dollars to make your movie by people who absolutely have a stake in this financial stake and creative stake. I mean, the, you know, a studio, studio executives are not some empty suits. They're awfully talented people, many of whom were filmmakers, many of whom come from a very serious development background and they have lived and experienced, you know, how to structure a movie and the successes, the failures, et cetera, um, all throughout their, lives and to not include them um, as part of the process is is disrespectful i i believe not to mention the fact that there are great you know cinematographers that have really been the star of many movies that i've worked on and have saved many movies or the editors as you well know an editor can be so <sighs> impactful and can help or hurt a movie 
you know, tremendously, uh, you know, I, I have a podcast, it's called Don't Kill the Messenger. And, and I just interviewed two editors, and I wanted the editors on there. Um, one was Billy Goldenberg, uh, and, who won the Oscar for Argo. And the other is David Rosenblum, who was nominated for Oscar for Insider. And there's, there's I mean, great. These are two really, really terrific, terrific editors. And and we talked very much about the alchemy of what makes a movie successful. So if, and I want to qualify this, if a director has raised their own money, is wrote the movie, uh, is producing it and directing it, and is what we used to call the auteur, true auteur. Yeah, you want to make it and you don't care about the financial repercussions or how to leverage your art, your asset if you will, uh, go with God. But that's not 99.9% .9 of how any movie is done or constructed. I still think if you are an auteur, you should include the audience in the discussion because who are you making this for? Any purist filmmaker is, says they're making a movie for the big screen, okay? Mm -hmm. But if you're making it for the big screen, that implies that you want an audience to see it. And if you are going in that direction, getting feedback, getting how things land, at the very least, is at least giving you uh, an indication of what to expect. And I like to say, and I've said it a bunch of times, if somebody hunks at you on a freeway, you know, um, you know, you're an asshole. I'm sorry, they're an asshole. If somebody hunks at you on a freeway, single person, they're an asshole. But if five people are hunking at you on the freeway, you're the asshole. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're right. And so you can choose if everybody is saying your ending is is bumming me out in a way that is betraying what came before it. You can have sad endings. That's not the issue. But it's just not working. It's just not satisfying emotionally or intellectually. Or your movie is like so long in the middle, it goes on forever and I disengage. That is just not a good thing. And if everyone's telling you that, you can choose not to listen if you paid for it yourself and all. But if you haven't, then you wanna hear them and say, okay, what can I do? You know, Ron Howard says it best, Alex, he really does. He says, look, I get to, I get to find my script, okay? I get to cast it the way I want to. I develop it the way I want to first, then I cast it, then I shoot it my way. Then I edit it with my editor and then I show it to an audience. And at that point, I have to give my child sort of uh, send them to nursery school, if you will, or to, you know, and that's really painful, uh, hard to do, right? You know, oh my gosh, they're really becoming a, an, a person. And it's when the rubber hits the road and you have to choose at that point whether to turn off or listen. And in my experience in 35 years, the great filmmakers and the most successful ones listen. They listen to the audience. They don't necessarily make all the changes an audience says to make, but they listen and try to address why they're saying what they're saying. Just because someone says that scene doesn't belong may not be the answer to the fix by removing that scene. It may be something leading up to it. I often say, and filmmakers on your podcast are going to agree with this completely, when there's ending problems, and there often are in many movies, as we know, it's the most important thing that a, a moviegoer is, is left, or a movie viewer, we're saying now, because so many are on streaming, are left with. Therefore, you want your ending to land in a certain way. And... If you, um, if you can, um, you know, sort of get that right, then you can change potentially the DNA and the trajectory of your of your of your picture. Now, there was a very famous um, example uh, that, that I've. It was so famous that it, it reached the public knowledge, which was Fatal Attraction how that movie was completely yeah. changed by the screening. And I saw the original ending and it was a bummer and it did not 
it didn't it, it completely failed the movie well, that we saw so what i was going to say about before we get into fatal attraction to to finish the point i was just making is that often the ending is not the issue it's act one that's the issue mm. and because act one was not set up correctly this is a very common right. problem they you can't just fix an ending Often, sometimes you can. Sometimes in a comedy, particularly, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a or in Fatal Attraction. In Fatal Attraction, they reshot it. Well, in Fatal, but what you have to look at in Fatal Attraction is how did it become so successful in the new ending? Because what they set up was this guy, Michael Douglas, who was essentially a good guy who screwed up and had an affair on another with another woman, but it was a one night thing, and. She didn't think so, Glenn Close. Obviously. As we know. Uh, Ann Archer, the wife, um, was ready at by the end of the movie to forgive him. So in other words, he was on a path that clearly was felt like he was wanting to redeem himself and do the right thing. But she wouldn't let it go. So, he, you know, but what happened was because they set that up, I think the audience was really bummed out that it became about Alex, sorry, the character. Uh, and the character sort of uh, took her own life at the end of the movie, which was kind of, in many people's view, from a satisfaction standpoint, um, a cop out for right. and not having uh, emotionally feeling like he, the the lead, Michael Douglas, would get his proper comeuppance. And the wife, of course, didn't get any comeuppance. Um, and so the audience spoke in loudly and v very um, much so in their scores, in their ratings, that the ending was not working. So what they did is they went back and realized the setup that they had done needed to pay off. Right, right. They were they were ramping it up. They were ramping it up, right. ramping it up. And they just dropped the ball at the end. Exactly. Exactly. Like, and you could feel, by the way, in the room, when you were in the room for that movie, you could feel the air being sucked out of the room. It and was amazing. In the focus groups afterwards, I would say, uh, so how many of you uh, like the movie? Every hand goes up. What were their ratings? Their ratings were like six excellent, uh, 10 very good, four good, no fairs or poors. But because of that, muted excellent people were not definitely recommending it they were only probably recommending it so there is a correlation between the definite recommend and how well your movie's multiple is going opening weekend multiple is going to be right so in other words if your movie opens to 10 million and you do a three times multiple that means you've done 30 million or will do 30 million at the box office so there's a correlation between that word of mouth and the box office multiple and so we don't want to torture filmmakers. What we want to do is say there are real financial implications that can be garnered, you know, and gleaned from this. So uh, in the case of that, it was a muted, definite recommend response. And the movie would have probably, if not for this new ending, eh, done, I don't know, 30, a decent 40, boxer. Yeah, 30, decent box million. office. Yeah, because it was a it was a very fine movie. And good stars and, and all that stuff, yeah. They made the decision reluctantly, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> reluctantly by many to shoot. I mean, I, when I say many, Glenn and Adrian Lyne were against it. Uh, <laughs> Michael Douglas was for it. Different people have told me this. So uh, I'm speaking from other people's uh, recounting of this. Uh, and so uh, they they all acquiesced and they shot this amazing, amazing <laughs> Suspenseful. Oh, it's cocky. That, it was beautiful. In that bathroom. Oh. It's cocky and, and then some because it was like a twist on a twist. And now people talk about it as the fatal attraction ending. And for any filmmaker, uh, Gotta watch that movie. you must see the movie if you haven't seen it uh, because now several years have gone by. So many younger people maybe haven't seen it. You must see it. And and so this thing where, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it, but I will tell you that it's, um, Michael Douglas gets redemption. Uh, Glenn Close gets what she deserves. The wife gets redemption or, you know, not and, redemption, uh, retribution. I didn't mean redemption. Michael does, does get redemption, sort of. But and, 
there's and he gets some comeuppance. He does get some comeuppance as well that he has well, to deal I mean. with that ending. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hundred yeah, yeah. yeah. percent. The audience cheers. Okay. Cheer. The scores come up. I don't know, 20, 30 points, and the movie does. Oh, it's a huge, huge. Become, yeah. You know, she's on the cover of Time Magazine. And no, it's, it was a cultural. Zeitgeist. It was. It was in the zeitgeist. Yeah, there's no That's question. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And that was absolutely because audiences spoke. And it's why it's such a great and known example. But there's so many. I mean, I work on, I think I've done well, over five or 6,000 movies in my in my career, titles. And most of them have some kind of change. Well, let me ask you, because this is another legendary one, Airplane, which is, I think, before your time. It was before my time. Air, I, but, came in 80, I came in the um, late 80s. Right. So from what I heard, that airplane had the worst, uh, the worst possible scores in the history of the studio at the time. And they're like, oh, my God, this is going to bomb. We can't fix this because there's no fixing airplane. You can't change a scene and change airplane. It's all a giant, you know, airplane movie. You can't change it. And then it comes out and it's a monster hit. And from what I heard was that People at that time were embarrassed to say that they liked it because it was so silly and there hadn't been something that silly up to that point in that way before. Because if you watch Airplane today, you're just like, this is amazing. <laughs> Are you talking about the, the 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 real the one with Karen Black where uh, the, or are you talking yeah, about the comedy? the comedy? The comedy, the comedy, comedy. Well, there was an airport. I, no, right. there was the airport. No, I'm talking about airplane. Right. By right, the Zuckers. Right. By the Zuckers. Sure people know yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Zuckers, I yeah. mean, that introduced an entire genre that had mm -hmm. never the spoof that had never really existed. Uh, and so there was no precedent for it. Right. So that's another reason why probably it didn't score well, is that people didn't know where to put it, how to classify it. Right. It's exactly. so goofy. <laughs> I remember working on the naked guns. Oh God, yeah. I did every <laughs> one of them. And I mean, from nuns falling down the staircase. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, nice just, beaver. Just, yeah. Great. <laughs> stupid shit all over the place. It's, 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 it's so funny. great. Yeah, so, yeah. so funny. And uh, and people just lost it. And But they were they were coming in with an expectation. And so. It was a naked gun, yeah. Exactly. So you needed to deliver on that claim. So each one had to, like, surpass the one before it, which sometimes is successful, as you know, and sometimes not when you get to sequels. But, uh. And that's only increased uh, that that uh, when I as IP has taken more of a front seat and sort of the notion of the big idea had, became like the central focus of what drove people to theaters, uh, you know, the the uh, you had to satisfy you had an, more of a uh, if you were a studio if you were a filmmaker more of a responsibility to give the audience what they wanted. Right, without without question. Now, and how, out of could all not, how could you not test that? How could I mean? How could you not? <laughs> exactly. You know, I I have kind of have a reverence for the audience. Uh, when I call the audience, audience can be ten people or it could be a million people. Um, just the word audience, and that's why the book is called Audienceology because I kind of have become an advocate um, for, for the, audience. the people. Yeah, and the people. One person doesn't necessarily change the world, but the you know wisdom of crowds, as they say, it's a phrase and books that are out on that. Uh, there's validity to that, and it's that whole thing about the hunking on the freeway. It's like you want to um, you want to listen to what the general consensus is. It doesn't mean you dumb it down. It means that you say, okay, if all of these people are saying that, how can I figure out? So a lot of my time is spent helping the filmmakers figure out what is going beneath the surface, you, you know, and that is also part of the art, I guess, of what I do, which is going back to my acting roots of understanding a character and peeling back the onion to get to those layers underneath the character to be able to bring that that asset to filmmakers and say, well, here's what I think they're really saying. This is the subtext here as opposed to, you know, change your ending. It's a comedy, needs more comedy. You know, like those things are unhelpful um, majority of the time. What was, in all your 5,000 plus uh, screenings that you've done over the course of no, your career? No, I've done 
twenty thousand plus twenty titles titles, 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 titles. No, I titles, mean that yeah. because just so you know, I mean I'm literally out almost every night. Uh, <laughs> well, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. I mean, I have a battery of folks that 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 do uh, this for you now. Yeah, do it but with, with all with the me, experience, with me. yes. Um, what's the worst? What's the worst screening experience you've ever went through that you can say publicly? <laughs> Like well, the movie screened poorly, the filmmaker oh, oh, didn't accept well, had, it. My, my worst experiences were on the what the audience didn't see, which they were uh, they were logistical nightmares, uh, where an entire audience was canceled by my people by accident because um. we were over confirmed, and uh, everyone flew in from London and from it was in New York and from L.A. and the expense that went into just showing oh. up <laughs> and a major, major big movie, a huge blockbuster. And there was like, there were like 40 people, the only 40 people who didn't get the message that it was canceled. And the reason that they canceled is because we were so over confirmed that the, we, we went back to cancel certain folks so that we wouldn't have a mad scene, a mob, you know, like a mob scene, a, a mad mad dash for so for the one, one of the biggest blockbusters of its day doors. you had four people show 40 people show up 40 people show up and within uh 40 minutes we got um about 280 people from the mall to come by uh, i said no matter any means uh and this thing scored so well oh, there sure. was no science to it though but it was one of the worst nights of my career and I recently had one where, you know, we have digital devices and the digital devices uh, that we use to collect the data. Um, we had a connectivity issue and it was a nightmare. And so, fair enough, you know, so, but we are now we're ready. We have ways to, you know, we have paper and pencil standing by in case there's that issue. So we're able to get the data, but it is so unnerving. So those are the things that I really remember. Uh, as far as a movie is concerned, there are some that are just misses. There are just some that you tested and there's complete and utter rejection. Doesn't happen often. It never happens with a studio. Uh, it's just wouldn't happen anymore with a studio because the stakes are so high and so many people have touched it. It's never a unmitigated disaster. These are usually independent movies uh, that just for whatever reason um, were not executed well, and and had marketing assets that just were like non-existent, you know, because there was nothing to hang your hat on. So you had not no marketability and you had no playability. And so what do you say? You come out and you just say, you know, you and you know they spent way too much on the movie. <laughs> so you're like, sorry. Very, those are those are really tough. Because you feel for these people and you know sure. some, somebody is going to be losing a lot of money. And the director, if they didn't invest their own money, will have reputational damage. And it's it's just a bummer. Well, well it was it was kind of like that movie Batgirl that Warner Brothers shelved recently. Like I've never heard of that before. Yeah, I know. How, I, I how bad say, is that movie that they can't just dump it on HBO Max? Like well, I don't get that. Well, you know, um, well. Uh, I don't know the particulars of that, but if I were a guessing man, I didn't work on that uh, uh -huh. particular movie. Another a company did. But uh, my guess is, first of all, I heard that it wasn't that bad, number one. How bad can it be? Like You what? They've, how bad? They've released Showgirls. They've released so many oh, I know, I know. movies but, over the years. But you have to also, what I would be asking myself is, is it damaging Political. the brand? Uh, oh. by, uh, their most important asset, one of their five most important assets in the arsenal. The Batman. Batman. Does it hurt the brand? Does it hurt DC? Uh, that's an, an issue that I can't really speak about. But, but they released Cat. But they released Catwoman for God's sakes. I know, but how many years ago was that? That was a while ago. Yeah, the Batman wasn't as no, big of DC a. DC wasn't DC then. So no, you no, you can't right. compare the two. Uh, look, uh, I'm about fixing things. I would take a different approach. Mr. Zaslov is, has his own financial sort of um, um, agenda, which is, I respect, I, I, how could you not? I mean, it's really difficult decisions that he has to, has to, has to undertake, but 
the fact is, is, is um, that was part of the, that was part of the casual, it was a casualty of that. Um, Makes sense. So, you know, I, as a researcher, um, I've fixed through audience reaction, so many movies. And I would love to have uh, taken a stab at it. My guess is I heard that they probably needed to reshoot a bunch. Um, so are you going to spend exactly? Are you going to spend more money? I mean, like World War Z. I mean, they reshot oh a ton, maybe a quarter of the movie, um, and it was a big hit, huge. So I, yeah. I I do think that it's a it's a tough thing to look at, and until we are in the um, we are in the shoes of um, of of David Zaslav or of the executives at Warner's who made that decision, it's really hard to just say why would why did they do it i'm sure there was a compelling reason to do it if not more than a compelling reason and yeah because it's unheard of really it's for a film of that it's kind, magnitude. Of unheard, it's kind of unheard of it's kind of unheard of to and, shelve a what was a hundred million dollars at least something yeah, like that i don't know i don't know what it was but but yeah something big and and you know you you also don't want the reputational damage which it did it they oh, did yeah. get a lot of flack for it. And I'm sure that was weighed in the equation. And it's just, it's a lousy decision, no matter how it, how it comes yeah. about. But it's a, it's a lose, lose. It's a lose, lose. It's kind of it. It kind of yeah. is. So There's it kind of is. And yet yeah. it was done, you know? Now, I, this is a question I'm, I'm, I really want to hear your opinion on because you've been working in the business for so long. And obviously in the 30 plus years you've been working in this, you've seen the business change. You know, you went through the VHS days the DVD days, uh, and now the streamer days, home but, box office days, yeah, the, and the, yeah, mail days, yeah, all of those, yeah, and it, you know when you know Arnold Schwarzenegger just shows up reading a, a telephone book and hits a twenty million dollar opening. I remember these days, but the theater experience seems to be not only taking a hit, but is it going the way of blockbuster video? Like in the next 10, 15 years, are there just going to be less screens because the theatrical experience? You know, and don't get me wrong, when a movie shows up like Top Gun or Avatar, um, but those are the only two experiences, I can, the only two movies I can think of right away that everybody went out to go see. What do you believe is going to happen? And where do you think this is all going in the theatrical experience? Because I grew up in the theatrical experience. I love movies. You obviously grew up in that time period. It's, it, there's nothing like being in a what movie mean, theater. Obviously. Obviously. <laughs> you just said 30 years, sir. You look 25. <laughs> You just oh, said 30 odd years, and know, that's why know, I'm basing that on, sir. You look fantastic. I, I set myself right up with that one. You look fantastic, sir. Um, no, but but seriously, like we both, yeah. you know, kind of grew up in, the, in that field. So there's nothing like the theatrical experience, but this new generation didn't yeah. grow up with it. Yeah, so right. what do I you mean, think? Yeah, well, I, I think that um, it's, uh, it's never coming back to the way it was. Uh, and I just think it's not an indictment on movies. It's not an indictment on the particular movie uh, necessarily. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, it's more of an indictment, if you will, on consumer behavior and new generations uh, with the replacement of, of movies as a prime source of entertainment with television and gaming, with social media and short form entertainment, Gen Z's are really, and half of millennials are really, uh, I wouldn't say rejecting the theatrical experience. They just don't care about it in the same way that you and I did because we had, there was a nostalgic quality to it. There was a romanticism. There's something about being in a theater that excites us because mm -hmm. we grew up with it. So we have different memories and so forth. The younger generation just doesn't feel that. So as people age out and age up, there's going to be less attendance uh, in terms of a wide variety of movies in a theater. Three things happened that have never occurred at the same time, right? Which is this notion of choice, so much choice. The notion of price. The price is just too damn expensive to not be selective about what you're going to see. And convenience. 
you know, it takes what about 40 minutes on average, I think it's 38, 40 minutes to decide what movie and get in a car to go to like, that's the average as opposed to like 16 or 17 minutes to choose a movie through streaming uh, and, 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 and be at home. You can buy five or six streaming services for the cost of a family of four going to one movie with concessions and parking, et cetera. Uh, you can't compare the, 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 the value proposition. However, people still like going to the movies. They also like um, going out of the house occasionally. Occasionally. But <laughs> movies will become more of a product of like a show or a concert. And what that means is an experience. So if you don't have a movie that has some kind of experiential um, component to it, uh, elevated fun, elevated fun, elevated, that means a horror movie that is oh, it's just... really kick-ass. A yeah. comedy that, still comedies have not really come back. No. Uh, and I'm not sure they, they, they will. There will be a comedy that just does so well. You know how remember like crazy, there's something about crazy, Mary, like a crazy or, rich Asians. Remember how that snuck in? That, that snuck in, but that was pre-pandemic too. So that's the other thing too. I understand that. I understand yeah. that, but no one expected it to do the blockbuster business. There will be one because there's always one. There's one like, like just when everyone said romantic comedies are dead, you know, Ticket to Paradise comes in and sort of works, and then uh, just when they said dramas are dead, you know, Man Called Otto comes in and and works, but it doesn't work that well I, they work right. okay sure. but they're not i mean it does make a point or can prove a point that there is an audience that will still go but it's far less so really the this as the population grows actually more people will go to movies but we'll see su such fewer fewer movies fewer titles so what you just said is 100 percent right now i have um a theater in and a screening room in my house. Uh, so I watch everything on a big screen and it's with Dolby and the whole thing. And I'm very blessed to have that. Uh, so I never need to go to a theater and I spend my, my life working on movies in theaters. Uh, but I left my house to see Avatar in IMAX. Because, of course, 3D. of course. And I, did I too. left my house to see Top Gun. Yes, I, I did too. I believe you chose. I did not leave my house for anything else. You and me are the exact same. It's the only two movies I've seen I in know. a theater other than maybe press screenings or something like that. No, but, no, I'm not talking about work. No, no, that's different. I, Cause I went, I, I just saw man from auto and things like that, but theatrically, but for me to get out, go pay tickets, it was Top Gun. Cause I was like, I have to go see Top Gun. Right. Cause it's an experience. And I go, it's Avatar because it's Avatar and I it's James Mission Cameron. Impossible in a theater. I will probably see Mission Impossible I'll 2 in the theater. I'll probably see Oppenheimer in a theater. You know, you're absolutely right. That's probably another. But again, these are. Even though it's a drama, quote unquote. But it's, but it's Nolan. I trailer and I was it's like. It's Nolan. It's Nolan. It's Christopher Nolan. It's, it's going to be theatrical. It's going to be an experience. But, but the Fablemans, I'm not going to go see that in the theaters. I want to see it. And it's. I, I, I'm looking and forward to it. it's wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. You know what's so interesting? Um, there's a great filmmaker. Um. And I'm not being cheeky. I really don't remember. Uh, uh, when I say great filmmaker, a very popular filmmaker, a very mm -hmm. well uh, well known filmmaker. And but I forgot that which one it is. But said this quote, which is my favorite movie of all time is Jaws, mm -hmm. and I have never seen it in a movie theater. Isn't that interesting? Uh -huh. I've so, I've never seen this, Jaws in a the movie theater. Of, yeah. This yeah. notion of you have to see things in a movie theater is just not the case and and if it were the case the academy of which i'm a member would you know make it mandatory that people have to see movies in a theater it's just unrealistic and it's just not true uh i don't get any less enjoyment from 90 percent of most movies because i've seen them on a big screen uh forget my screening room but i'm talking about like a big screen of any of us have with a yeah, flat screen. I, yeah. Well, just having a 72 inch it's an, and you have a lot of people, a lot of my friends have these sound packages that are really cool in their rooms Ridiculous. that yeah. are 
surround sound, et cetera. And they, and they really emulate the experience. And many theaters have gone the wrong direction in a way and have tried to emulate the living room as a way to ingratiate the consumer and bring them in. So they have these great reclining seats and the screens have gotten smaller. You're right. So it's like, as the theaters have condensed their the experience to make it more elite or, you know, like food service and all, and homes have gotten bigger and will get bigger. You know, the consumer electronics show shows walls of screen, like uh, walls of screen in your home. It, it will end up being a feature like marble floors and granite counters. No, it's like, it's, it's, it's Total Recall. Like Total Recall had that, like they that, just turned them. But I'm saying, yeah. I would say, exactly. But I would say, you'll be, you'll say, I'll like, I'd like the full screen in the game rec room or the den uh, and the sound package uh, as well, also in the master. So you're going to have like a wall screen and it'll be part of the feature of the buildings, built-ins. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So this is going to happen. Um, so everything um, points to there's going to be, a con there has to be condensing uh, a reduction of screens. I mean, Regal just filed for bankruptcy, as you know. Um, they're closing one of my favorite theaters in Los Angeles, which is Sherman Oaks. Uh, they're closing Sherman yeah wow were you in la yeah i've been i was in la for 13 years yeah so this is that's my theater that i go to um or burbank uh that's an amc yeah the burbank i i lived in burbank so that was my amc was the yeah, burbank. yeah and they my, always had the test screening guys out front always oh well we do i'm there probably once a week i think every I every of, always always you know, like every a second, time we, a second home I, I, like i like i own a second home in burbank at the theater uh <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm there a lot and uh it's just a, it's a lot of people like it it's a it's a very good testing um location because it is ethnically uh racially uh diverse Mm -hmm. It has a level of sophistication, but also sort of working class folks, you know, I Burbank does that regular, <laughs> regular people, regular people. Burbank do that, uh, does that. But, and there's a, there's also, you get a mixture of, you know, uh, ed education, which is really nice. So as far as testing, it emulates a lot of pockets in the United States. So it's a good, it's a good testing ground. So it's like the block in Orange County or Long Beach. Uh, those are really important uh, in well, the LA area. Well, let me ask you then, um, with all this conversation of theatrical, where does that leave you in the work that you do? Do you still do test screenings for things that are going to streaming? And oh, how is yeah. that how is that work? Well, it speaks to our conversation that we had at the beginning of the podcast, which is people are going to it's important to get your the the opinions of folks, whether it is what the platform agnostic, in other words, it's whether it, it is um, in, on a streamer, debuting on a streamer or debuting in a theater, that word of mouth is going to dictate how, uh, how strongly the movie will perform. And streamers want and report now on drops uh, as well. They want to make the best version of itself they possibly can. And when I say the best version, I mean the one that appeals to the widest, widest number of folks. And that is a very important determination. So uh, all of the streamers uh, are my clients. And even, and even I though- say, May I say now, my biggest clients. And I will say this, I also, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, we went into triage mode at Screen Engine ASI, which is my company. We went into triage mode and we we came up with, we invented a synchronous, that means in real time, screening platform for two to 300 people that you as a filmmaker can stay in your home and watch people watching your movie at once. So that's where it's gone. And well, a lot of it did go there, but many people still are holding on to this notion of looking at a movie in a theater. So half our business is on the small screen and half our business is still on the big screen. And we've only increased exponentially because as content increases, so does our business. Because as you're saying, and, and it's a really good point, just because something is not theatrical is not an indictment on your movie, yet you need the same results. You need strong word of mouth. 
You want to have good critics ratings. You want to have audience scores so that your subscribers, if it's a streamer, are satisfied. Like these are important things to know and understand. And unless you engage with the audience, how the hell are you going to know that? Well, doesn't doesn't the streamers have an immense amount of data that the studios just do not have in the sense of the algorithm and what people are watching and when they're coming off? I mean, they know so many data points on a movie. That's one of the reasons why, from what I understand, Adam Sandler keeps getting those $100 million deals at Netflix because their data states – People watch it. People, you know, click on it. People continue to enjoy his kind of humor, his kind of films. Where most of us out, like, like, how is Adam keep getting all these? Kind of, he's a silly film. A lot of his movies are silly and, and comical when he's not doing his dramatic stuff. But you're like, wow, he's still going. Like, why is Netflix yeah, I doing mean, they this? They do have clearly. They have more, many more data points and metrics than the studios are able to. But you know, like, we have a product called um, Post Track. So mm -hmm. every week. Screen Engine ASI is in partnership with Comscore. And um, it's the exit poll currency. Everyone subscribes to the product. And we gauge a uh, reaction to studio movies and who actually showed up. So mm. we can tell you the actual audience demography and how they rated it in those individual groups. Mm. So they're not without data. Sure. But it's definitely less sophisticated, of course, than the streamers are able to 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 have but you know theatrical is a big bet business right you're you're spending big dollars but there's no question that those marketing dollars at create a movie um getting into the zeitgeist that a streaming movie simply doesn't do and i believe increases the value of the ip even if it's not as successful in its theatrical run, the sort of the goodwill, if you will, or the 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 nature of the um, of the of the asset takes on uh, a more important, you know, life uh, hmm. than if it doesn't have a campaign behind it. It feels has more gravitas. It feels like it's a bigger thing. Um, so, with that comes the positive of what I just said. But it also comes with tremendous risk because you have to make that much more money to make back the P P and A, right? Uh, and that the P and A is could be significant, you know, um, on on movies, and you know you have to sort of double down. It's kind of like you're you're what you talk about Batgirl. So if you know if Batgirl was something that was going to go theatrical, yeah. uh, they'd have to spend how much to get people oh, hundred. 150, yeah, something like that. It'd be insane. Probably, probably somewhere between, my guess is somewhere between 75 and 100 worldwide uh, to to get that movie, uh, you know, properly placed, et cetera. So you have to then say, where does one cut their losses? And that is what more and more people will probably be doing. But cutting your losses usually means then taking a loss, but going on a stream or not investing in the P&A. But if streamers don't want the movie, or if you think you might do damage to your overall brand, there may be a compelling business reason to to do it. And so, um, yeah. It's 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 fairly interesting. Um, now, uh, can you talk about your new film, Audienceology? In that film, book, Audienceology. Well, it's being made into a film. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yes. uh, Starring I mean, Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. It's amazing. First of all, my <laughs> book is, is a, oh, it's a year old already, but it's um, it's been a bestseller. Simon and Schuster, uh, mm -hmm. pretty thrilled about it in its category. May I add, it's not like mm -hmm. um, New York Times. You know, we've sold two million copies, uh, but it is um, gotten really great um, feedback and 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 press and um, critical response and. I couldn't be more proud of it. I worked on it with my um, with my co-author Darlene Heyman for like twelve years, oh, and wow. so it was interviews, 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 and then finding the right voice and structure, and uh, and because it was as successful as it it has been, and it's now in paperback. Uh, Simon and Schuster gave me a second book, which I'm writing right now with my co-author Bob Levin, and that is called How to Score in Hollywood. And that book is about <laughs> great title. Thank you so much. You know, if I don't come up with a good title, you know, you know, that's not that's not good. That's not good. Uh, consider it having having been tested, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, but what I was going to say was um, uh, that book is about getting to the green light. And what does it take to get to the green light? What's the alchemy? And what goes through people who are in that position to give it the yes? What do they go through? What are they feeling? How much audience response do they use? How much should they use? Uh, and so we take on that debate a little bit as well. So I think it's going to be a fun, fun read. Uh, but I have no idea when I'm going to finish it because uh, we're about halfway through. We love where it's going. So does so does the publisher. But I'm running a business. I am doing my oh. podcast. I'm doing, you know. <laughs> Uh, and I think, by the way, I think a lot of people who do, um, actually listen to yours would like my podcast. If I can do a shameless plug. Sure. Of course. <laughs> don't kill the messenger. It's called, mm -hmm. uh, which don't kill the messenger came about because that was originally gonna be the title of audienceology. And, uh, it's interesting. That was my title for a long time. So I was kind of married to it. And it basically, the, the the publisher uh, at Simon Schuster thought it was maybe a little too self-serving and and let's put it on the audience, which is what it's all about. And in, in I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, uh, Patrick Goldstein did a uh, feature on the calendar, cover of the calendar section of the LA Times. And he he dubbed me the, the doctor of audienceology. And, uh, and when I brought that up in the book, they said, you know, we love this idea of, and that's how audienceology came to be. And it really has kind of taken on a life of its own. And in terms of the possibilities and and so forth, um, maybe doing a TV show and around it and all that. Uh, in any event, uh, don't kill the messenger is what it means. It's I'm coming in to deliver the news uh, of the audience. Uh, you know, don't beat me up. It's the easiest thing to do is to is to is to pick on the guy who's uh, who's, who has to give you the truth uh, and uh, or tell you the truth and. So it's a, been a sticky title. Uh, I kind of base the podcast on um, the notion of people have an interest in, like yours, it, it, your podcast. People have an interest in movies. Um, there are some war stories of screening experiences, but getting into uh, individuals who have made an impact, continue to make an impact, and how that affects kind of, as you said, the post-production and and in particular, the screening process. Now, uh, my last question to you is, what is the craziest, most entertaining, insane screening event that you can talk about publicly? <laughs> I think the one that pops in my head, well, two of, uh, uh, two of them pop into my head, Borat. Oh my God, what was the Borat like? The Jesus. original Borat, the original Borat screening, which was in oh. Marina Del Rey. Remember, no one oh. really, some people knew the Ali G character. Yeah, but, but no, like, he, yeah. They didn't yeah. know Sasha Baron Cohen really. He he did this movie. It was, oh, no one ever saw anything like it. And people were pissing in their pants. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, I, was, doing, I died. You know, the wave, like the wave they do at ball games. They were doing that. One guy got up from, he was sitting like in the fifth row to the screen. He got up and ran up and down the aisle with his arms and people were just laughing at that because he couldn't contain himself when the teabagging scene happened. Oh, no, the, no, it's just, it just was, it was it was it, people were just out of their minds. And so it scored hugely. And it was a great it was one of those magic moments of your experience, something in a culture. You know what I mean? And the other thing, another one was like was something about Mary. Oh yeah, another one when, like that. Yeah, when Ben when Ben um, Stiller comes out with the with the hair gel. Uh, oh, you not him. Um, um, Cameron yeah. Diaz. Cameron Diaz has she has no, the no, hair no, gel because of his. Sorry. No, she, she yeah she gel. she comes out with sorry, it yeah because with of his, this thing, his thing. his manhood. Uh, his manhood. <laughs> you were into what I was going to say, uh, but uh, and with the zipper. Oh, the zip. Oh, the, oh, and when the dog flies out the window, with Lynn Shea. I mean, see, you're, I, if you can't that was see good. Alex, I'm right laughing now, my ass off. Yeah, He's because losing. those imagine oh. being in that first screening and first. not knowing that that was oh, what it was, it was just crazy. And people, it was one of those. And I've, I've had many of those. The first screening of Forrest Gump, the first screening of Titanic. Uh, oh my god, what was the Titanic screening like? It was people went nuts because it was one of those, it was, I compare it in the book to uh, the Gone with the Wind screening that is uh, alleged to have happened. It did happen. I spoke to Samuel Goldwyn before he passed away about it because he had talked directly to Daryl. 
Daryl, uh, not Daryl Zanuck, um, uh, David Oselznik. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially it was, we, we got the executives to Minneapolis. Um, no one knew what we were going to see. Fox, Tom Sherrick arranged it. So people just showed up at the airport for the private jet and we were flown to, to Minneapolis. And uh, Jim Cameron was there already trying to set up lights and for the question, you know, and arranging things. And, and I said, this is not great expectations, which is what we were told we were going to see. That was a fake title. So people thought they were going to see great expectations. And when I, when I um, uh, mentioned that, actually, I don't think I mentioned the title. What happened was I said, I'm so glad you're here. And they're like, what is it? What is it? And then all of a sudden, the water thing comes up and that water image and People thought it was a trailer at first. And then it said Titanic. And people were like, oh, it was one of those. And because um, because because at the time for everyone listening, everyone was bashing Titanic because it's oh, never going to work. The world's oh, biggest flop. It haters, is, it, how haters. are you going to even how can you make a movie about Titanic? We all know the ending and all of this stuff. Very good. So, Alex. Oh, I remember all of that because they were just killing Jim over the most expensive movie ever made and all this. Hundred percent. So that was that oh, was. Oh, oh, we're gonna watch that it. That was crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> uh, and I re also remember. Oh, there was a great story of um, of us recruiting. Uh, I remember it was. I think it was t the first Toy Story, and um, but we recruited it under. Something um, it wasn't Benji, but it was something like Lassie, a, a movie, <laughs> something like Lassie or Benji. And we recruited the movie with this, and then we get up to announce the name. It wasn't me, but another colleague got up to announce the name of the movie, and people were like, Boo, because they'd never heard of Toy Story. And by the end of it, a new franchise was born, and people were like, Benji, who Lassie, what? Like, <laughs> what yeah, because imagine, movie? imagine seeing Toy Story for the first time That's when right. nothing had ever That's right. been released like That's that right. before. Right. I can't right. even imagine. I know. So you've got all these great, great stories. First, yeah. People, audiences discovering these great movies. It's magic. And I think and you were saying that there's going to be a comedy that's going to break through again, something like Borat. If anyone has the balls to make a film, because I remember watching Blazing Saddles. It, it, when I when I was working at the video store when I was a young man, I worked at a video store. That's I where worked, I. That's, that's where, where I. Uh, in five years, five years, mom, mom and pop in Florida. Uh, My mom, mom and pop, pop was in um, New York City, and yeah. um, I was the weekend manager. Oh, I was I, I was I was a manager. I was a manager at fifteen. I, listen to this. <laughs> so talk about finding your end. I was I, I I realized the owner was just Blockbuster was soon to open a year later. But it was before Blockbuster, and I put a business plan together, and I said, "I want to buy your business." And guess what? He fired me. <laughs> what? He, he felt threatened. I was twenty-one years old. He felt threatened, and um, and I was dumbfounded. It was the greatest thing ever. And a year later, he was out of business because Blockbuster went on Seventy Ninth Street, and it was Done. like. Done. Do all those mom and pops, as you know, went out of business. Done. They were done. But I was. I remember watching Blazing Saddles because I was. Those, those, those are the times I was watching. That's what before. we did when we we would walk, put movies on while we were. We had to re-shrink wrap our movies. So they obviously, real. obviously, I did the I same mean, thing. Real. New, new. You right. Know, yeah. New. When you're going to resell yeah. the used ones, you yeah. re-shrink wrap them. Right. You put them out. Of course, of course. Uh, yeah. And I used to play Nintendo in the back and watch movies up front. So I'm watching Blazing Saddles. And I went and to the X-rated section here and there. I didn't, not the, lie. our city did not allow pornography. Oh, Florida. So it was that area of, there was like a couple, couple what counties area, over. What area? Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale for oh, whatever really? reason. That's more didn't, aggressive than a lot of. Uh, it did not allow it, but like, geez. if you went to another city, you could, but for whatever. So I never had that joy uh, um, as a young so man. Sorry. <laughs> so but, sorry. But I'm watching Blazing if Saddles. If you've never seen Debbie Does Dallas, I'm just going to tell you right Well, now. I mean. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> listen, people find a way. But uh, <laughs> before there which was the internet. By the way, which we tested. No, I'm joking. No, which we tested. And that <laughs> one. <laughs> um, but watching Blazing Saddles, I said, this movie will never be. There's nothing that will ever come out as like ballsy as this film. Like it was just. It could, well, first of all, that movie could never come out today. Like as a, as a, it just in the culture, in the climate that we have today would never be able to come out today. 
But when Borat showed up, I was just like, how did this sneak through the guard gate? Like how in God's yeah. green earth did it, did they do it? And then when they released it during, I think it was pandemic or 2021, he released a sequel. I'm like, or 2020, whenever he released it. And like, we worked on that really. You I'm know, like, thank Sasha, God. <laughs> Sasha wrote a really, really nice quote for the back of my book. And uh, we worked, I did all the Borat second one too. And that oh. was beyond so much fun. And I just interviewed on my podcast, Monica Levinson, who produced it. And she talks about, you know, if you want to hear it, the, sure. her, being, her being arrested and how that all worked and how they get releases and stuff. That was pretty cool. The, how they were able to do stuff like, but what, but, but, you know, and, and not to go off too far off the train here for a second, but what Sasha does, he, his life is threatened. Like the stuff that he would do, it was like life threatening situations. He put himself in for our comedy, like Did serious see, stuff. No, that, that concert, we talk about the concert, you know, that yeah. concert Yeah. in the second, in the second one. And you saw that they were trying to tip over the ambulance that he was being taken. He was genuinely fear, fearful. I mean, you could see it. He, because he just, he, he might've jumped. He just might've gone too far. Like he just might've just, just a little bit might have gone too far because that's not who Sasha me, is. Not for me not either, for me. but but for his safety, he oh, might have gone. Safety. Well, yeah, yeah, that yeah that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> whole thing is gone. based on this authenticity, and so it's just amazing to me also what people will do and sign away. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh yeah, after Bor after Borat came out, there was like lawsuits trying to like I didn't well, like why well, because they signed the release and because they didn't know you know, like some of the stores he went into and some of the things he did and people signed the releases and they're like, no, no, it's like that whole dinner, that whole dinner scene where he comes back with a sack. Don't, of, don't of, get me, don't get me started. <laughs> I, I literally, I, when I watched the second one, I, I fell off my chair during the movie. Oh God. I forget what scene it was. I literally fell off my chair. I was in the desert. I was in Palm Springs doing it remotely uh, on this, the platform, the VirtuWorks platform. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, suddenly I'm like laughing so hard and I was on a small chair and I, I was, I pulled myself back <laughs> and I fell off and they're like, where'd he go? I laughed my ass. That is great. My... He's out of, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Kevin, uh, where can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing, sir? Well, my social media is uh, Kevin gets, that's G O E T Z. Yeah. Kevin gets 360. And uh, I'm on all the social media platforms and uh, the book is called Audienceology. Uh, it's on Amazon. It's the, there's a, you can get it. The, the, I read it as well. And then also uh, uh, the podcast is called don't kill the messenger. And that's also, you just Google that and it's on all the different platforms. Kevin, I appreciate your contribution to film history Thank over the last so 30 Alex, years, my friend. You're, Seriously, You're such a pleasure and you're such a wealth of knowledge. And Oh, it's thank a pleasure you. to talk to someone who is in the know and really gets <laughs> it. You have great enthusiasm, great enthusiasm. I appreciate you very much, my friend. Thank you again. Oh, thank you so much.